Hello, and welcome back to Bomb Chew. I'm Chris. And I'm Austin. And today we're taking a look at the Humble Choice Bundle from June 2020. Things on the outside world are, well, they're not great right now. But at least we've got a new bundle to help take our minds off things for a little while. Fans have been pretty critical of Humble Choice for the past few months, and not without good reason. So let's see how this month's options stack up. This month's sneak peek is a demo for Eichenfell, a turn-based tactical RPG following a group of magic-using students. Combat is where you'll be spending a lot of your time in this, so let's start with that. Battles take place on a grid where you and your opponents can move around and use positional spells. There's a timing element for attacking and blocking, similar to the Mario RPG games. If you tap the button at the right moment during an attack, you'll do extra damage, take less damage, or improve a buff or heal. For some moves, the timing is pretty obvious, but for others, there's a bit of trial and error, and the timing felt a little too tight for some moves, but that may just be my old man reflexes starting to dull. When you're not in combat, you're traversing a neat school campus. Enemies can be seen on the field, though some may pop out of the ground to surprise you. Either way, they can mostly be avoided, and any game with non-random encounters is doing something right in my book. The game starts in Chapter 2, so from a story standpoint, I wasn't getting a lot, but there was a charming little puzzle to follow clues from a ghost. Graphically, I'm a bit divided. I love the character portraits, but I'm not so in love with the tiny low-detail overworld sprites. I don't hate them by any means, but I have to spend most of my time looking at them, and the character portraits just look so much better. Music though, mmm, great music. Personally, I didn't have enough fun with the combat to want to keep playing, given it's such a major part of the game. It's a free demo though, so if it looks fun to you, give it a try. This month's Humble Original is Before I Forget, a narrative-focused walking sim from developer Threefold Games. I'm going to keep this review as minimal as possible, in order to avoid spoiling the story or ruining the experience for anyone. Before I Forget it follows the basic gameplay of a walking sim, with players moving throughout a house, examining objects, reading different letters and notes, and hearing voiceover dialogue and flashbacks to help tell the story. Obviously the main appeal here is the story itself, and I fell in love with the story being told in Before I Forget. It doesn't take long to pick up on the direction the story's going, but the way it's told gets you emotionally involved almost immediately. By the end of the one hour experience, I was crying pretty hard, although I admit I'm a sucker for these kind of stories and games. Even if you aren't usually into walking sims, Before I Forget has such a great visual style and a truly delightful piano-heavy soundtrack that does a wonderful job of pulling you in. It's definitely worth taking an hour of your day to play through. The King's Bird is a momentum and physics-based precision platformer. Hold on, don't leave just yet. I usually get turned off by the phrase Precision Platformer 2, but there are some points in favor of this game that may change your mind. This is a game with flight. Flight can only be used for a certain amount of time, and it's definitely not a superpower. It's almost more of a glide, but used properly, you can do some really cool stuff with it. For example, when you start gliding, you can't really go up very much, but if you dive down and then turn yourself up, you'll go flying. This comes paired with what I can only describe as a dash, which can be used every time you touch a new surface for a big boost of speed. Use your dash on ceilings and walls while you're flying, and you can get some incredible speed. I haven't fully grasped how the controls work together just yet, but a little experimentation has helped me figure out a lot. Once you reach proper levels, there will be places you can die, and this is where the precision platformer element comes in. However, there are checkpoints everywhere, and as you've probably noticed, the game feels almost like it's running in slow motion, so you have a lot of time to think and register what you want to do with your movements, and it makes those moments when you get that huge speed boost feel thrilling. And hey, the art style and music, just lovely. If you're a platformer junkie or love games that give you a great feeling of flight, check this one out. If you've never enjoyed a platformer, give it a pass. The Stillness of the Wind is a slow, peaceful game about tending to your small farm as an old woman. Your family has all moved away to the city, but you have your goats and your chickens. You'll use their milk and eggs, along with vegetables that you'll grow, to make food to eat and use for trading with a man who comes by every day. He'll also bring you letters from your family. It's a slow game, with slow movement and days that feel a bit long. If you can't really enjoy the first 30 minutes of this game, you probably won't enjoy the rest, but without getting into spoilers, it does take quite a turn. 
albeit a very slow and gradual turn. The core gameplay really wasn't for me, but looking ahead to where the game goes, I really like the narrative and where things go. If you're down for a slow burn, or you enjoy bright, cheery games with something hidden beneath the surface, this will be a good game for you. For people who need a faster pace, this is probably a safe drop. Overload is a first-person shooter from developer Revival Productions and released in 2018. Overload is a spiritual successor to the 1995 hit PC shooter Descent, and the game even features some of the same developers who worked on the original. Overload's story begins on a mining facility on one of the moons of Saturn. Something has caused the autonomous robots there to turn hostile, and a distress signal has brought the player in to help. Like in Descent, Overload has players taking control of a small robot or drone that features six degrees of freedom movement in a 3D environment with zero gravity. This results in the player being able to move and rotate in literally any direction as they navigate through the levels. As you make your way through each level, you'll be tasked with destroying enemy robots, finding security keys to progress, and rescuing human survivors. At its core, Overload is an old-school first-person shooter, similar to classic Doom or Wolfenstein, just with the full freedom of movement in every direction and orientation in 3D space. Gameplay is simple and straightforward, even if trying to figure out where you go or even which way is up isn't so easy. In fact, it's best you forget about the concept of up entirely, otherwise this game is going to make your head spin. I don't get motion sickness easily, but even for me, the movement in Overload gets a little barfy at times. Trying to orient yourself in a way that lets you get a feel for a room you've just flown into is one of the challenges you'll be faced with quite often. After about a half an hour of playing, I had to stop and give my sense of balance a break. I was a big fan of the original Descent and Descent 2 when I was a kid, so it's really cool to see a spiritual successor to that series in the modern age of gaming. That nostalgia does help me to overlook a lot of Overload's little flaws and imperfections, and just kick back and enjoy the barfy ride through 3D space. If you get motion sickness easily, you'll want to pass on Overload, but for everyone else, there's a lot of fun to be had here. Remnants of Nazith is another precision platformer, this time utilizing a grappling hook. This game has been on my radar for a while. I bought it a couple of years ago and somehow just never got around to playing it, so I was excited to finally sink my teeth in. Let me start by saying this is a game I would love to watch a speedrunner play, but it is way too hard for me. It starts off without too much trouble, but the difficulty quickly ramps up and doesn't stop. Levels are centered around using the grappling hook to gain speed, requiring you to let go at the right time or lose some of the precious speed you've gained. You also have a dash, an air jump, and wall jumps, and all of these can be used in combination like dashing during a swing to get super speed, or dash jumping to cover a lot of horizontal distance when there's nothing to hook onto. You can dash run on water and jump off it like a surface if you do it right. In each level, there is a ghost player to show you where to go and generally how to get there. But if you fall behind or die and go back to a checkpoint, you can kiss that ghost goodbye, unless you restart the level. Music is good, controls are tight, and retries are quick. The game's just too hard for me. This will be a solid pick for people who love Super Meat Boy enough to get to the end, or at least pretty far. If you don't get enjoyment from super difficult games, steer clear for sure. Stygian Reign of the Old Ones is a role-playing game from developer Cultic Games and released in 2019. Stygian takes place in the Lovecraft universe, and has players creating a character to try and tackle the madness of Arkham and beyond. Stygian goes all-in on the role-playing elements, and feels like a Call of Cthulhu-themed version of Disco Elysium. Character skills and abilities will affect what choices are available in any given situation. Maybe your character is an actor and is good at swaying people to their side with a silver tongue, or maybe you're secretly an occult worshipper trying to keep a low profile. The options are numerous, but since this is a Lovecraft setting, they all tend to lead to madness and death. The setting is easily Stygian's strongest asset. The world feels like it was lifted straight from the pages of Lovecraft stories, and the art and sound design help to make that world feel just as bleak, horrifying, and terrible as Lovecraft himself described it. Stygian features a fairly basic grid-based combat system, you can move your player around to try and flank enemies, attack them with your weapons, or even use your knowledge of the occult to cast spells to try and defeat your enemies. Despite this, the combat mostly ends up feeling pretty shallow, and it just feels like there's not enough you can do to try and keep your party alive. However, that's not as much of a negative point as you might think, as it fits right in with any of the role-playing systems used to adapt Lovecraft into an RPG before. Combat in the Lovecraft world should be your last resort, and it often ends in death regardless of how you approach it. 
This definitely rings true in Stygian, as I lost my first party member only a few encounters into the game, with my main character falling to madness and eventually being bludgeoned to death shortly after. While the game does feature a few annoying bugs and glitches, the atmosphere, storytelling, and traditional RPG elements come together to create an overall amazing experience. It doesn't take much to sell me on the idea of a game set in the Lovecraft universe, but Stygian goes above and beyond with the traditional RPG approach to the subject. I'll definitely be putting more time into Stygian. Men of War Assault Squad 2 is a military real-time strategy game developed by Digital Mindsoft and released in 2014. Men of War tests players with controlling a squad of units and attempting to complete different objectives in a variety of mission locales. Going into the single player drops players directly into some sort of story mode, and the history of the squad of units you're controlling plays out via a debriefing video. Once in control, you're tasked with sneaking into a military base, taking out the guards, and loading a truck with supplies for your allies. However, upon first stepping into the street, I'm immediately discovered, a firefight ensues, chaos erupts, and all my men are dead. Okay, that was a bad start, but they also just kind of dumped me into this encounter right away without a tutorial or anything. So, I go back to the menu to look for a tutorial, which I eventually find under bonus content for whatever reason. Alright, let's load up the tutorial and... Wait, it's just a blank screen. I try another, and another, only to be met with more blank screens. After a while, I figure out it's trying to load some kind of web page, but it appears to be broken, and it's definitely not helpful. What you have to do instead is go to the game's store page on Steam, scroll down to find the link to the game's manual, and read through a PDF of the game's original physical manual from 2014. Oh, and I also should mention that this manual isn't exactly helpful either. Its 39 pages feature explanations of in-game buttons that already have pop-up text to say what they do, as well as some advanced tactics and multiplayer tips that aren't relevant if you're still trying to grasp the basics of gameplay. I tried going through the starting mission a few times, and just could not make any kind of progress that didn't result in terrible looking firefights breaking out. Men of War Assault Squad 2 has its supporters, and the way they describe the deep gameplay and systems make it sound intriguing. However, the game does absolutely nothing to try and teach players any of these mechanics, or even the basic gameplay features, and in the end I just ended up smashing my head against the wall trying to make something work. If you're into deep strategy games that would prefer to cut off your hand rather than hold it, you might find something to enjoy with Men of War Assault Squad 2, but this game just isn't for me, and I won't be spending any more time with it. Felix the Reaper is a comedic puzzle game about life, death, and romance. You play as Felix, an ever-dancing bringer of death who is paradoxically in love with Betty, a bringer of life. While Betty is a creature of the light, Felix is forced to live in the shadows, and that's where the main mechanic of the puzzles comes in. Felix needs to manipulate scenes frozen in time to get a certain target killed in horrible accidents, but gosh darn it, the sun is out. Thankfully, at the push of a button, you can change the angle of the sun, and there are lots of objects strewn about to cast shadows that allow you to move around. It starts off pretty easy, but you'll have to quickly start using your brain to swap objects and create your own shadows where you need them. As a puzzle game, it has a unique and interesting mechanic. However, what made me fall in love with the game was everything else. Felix's dance moves. The excellent music. The funky phrases that come up on screen when you correctly complete a step of the puzzle. The comedy that somehow still has me laughing even when I'm being shocked by the brutal deaths. And the cherry on top, Patrick fucking Stewart is the narrator. That's right, Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the USS Enterprise will be talking you all the way through the game, and it's such a delight. If you like puzzle games at all, and you like to groove, this one will have you dancing in your seat alongside Felix. If you don't like puzzle games, well, the gameplay probably won't be for you, but there's still a lot of humor and groove and beats here that I'd at least suggest checking out a playthrough on YouTube. Barotrauma is a co-op submarine survival game from developer Undertow Games and released through Early Access in 2019. Barotrauma puts players as one of a few classes aboard a nuclear submarine exploring the depths of Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. Players can take on the roles of captain, whose job is to steer the ship and delegate orders, engineers who excel at fixing electrical devices, mechanics who focus on fixing mechanical devices and hull leaks, security officers who keep the ship safe from both external and internal threats, and doctors who try to keep everyone healthy. The mechanics of each different job are pretty complex, but luckily the game includes a tutorial for each job that shows you how to do the different things you should be focused on doing. 
From everything that I read online about the game prior to playing it, multiplayer co-op seemed to be the best way to experience Barotrauma. So after completing one of the tutorials to get a basic understanding of the gameplay, I hopped into an online lobby with Austin and a few viewers from the Bombchu stream on Twitch. When creating a lobby, you have the option of enabling different missions if you want some direction, or going full sandbox and tackling the murky depths to see what happens. I enabled the missions, sat myself in the captain's chair, and set sail for adventure. Chaos then erupted almost immediately, as the ship soon crashed into some rocks, was attacked by monsters, and left powerless sitting at the bottom of the ocean. We did manage to figure out a few things, such as how to get power to the ship and how to do crucial things like, you know, steer. We also quickly learned that using the sonar too much will alert monsters to our location and attack us. So, armed with this knowledge, we set out for a second adventure, but with an added twist. One of the options you can enable is turning one of the crew members into a traitor. Things were going a little bit smoother this time, until the traitor eventually caused the reactor to explode, and then eventually we all died once again. Barotrauma ties a lot of interesting gameplay ideas together. It's got a little bit of survival sim gameplay, some elements of survival horror, and the emergent multiplayer gameplay of something like Sea of Thieves. However, the game seems to be strongly reliant on multiplayer to get the most out of it. Even though you are able to play by yourself, and you can fill out a lobby with bots, so much of the core experience is tied to your player-controlled crew and the chaos that ensues as a result. Barotrauma is a lot of fun as long as you're playing with the right people. The atmosphere and presentation of a ragtag crew aboard a ship fighting the elements evokes a strong aliens kind of vibe, and it goes a long way to making me want to play more. If you've got enough friends to play it with, or don't mind playing online with strangers, there's a lot of fun to be had with Barotrauma, and I'll definitely be looking to play more in the future. The Messenger is a 2D side-scrolling action platformer developed by Sabotage Studio and released in 2018. The Messenger has you taking control of a ninja in a village that's under attack, waiting on the arrival of the mystical Western hero. The hero tasks you with taking a scroll up to the top of a mountain, dubbing you the titular Messenger. Gameplay is very similar to Ninja Gaiden, with players jumping and slashing their way through enemies to get to the end of the stage. Killing enemies and destroying certain bits of the environment awards players with Time Shards, a currency that can be used to acquire new skills and purchase various upgrades from a mysterious vendor. The controls for the Messenger also feature a mechanic called Cloud Stepping, which allows you to jump in the air after slashing an enemy or object. This all works together beautifully, and playing the Messenger just feels satisfying. Being able to cloud step your way through a room without touching the floor and clearing all the enemies at the same time is both impressive and also not that hard to pull off. Everything you're able to do is clearly conveyed and is perfectly complemented by the level design and enemy placement, making your intended approach to each area feel very natural and fluid. This level and enemy design also allows for multiple approaches to a room, giving you the freedom to experiment with cloud stepping and wall climbing to find alternate paths and hidden rooms. While the portion of the game that I played was a fairly straightforward Ninja Gaiden style action platformer, the messenger apparently changes things up a bit after a while. The graphics go through an upgrade from 8-bit to 16-bit, and eventually the messenger becomes more of a Metroidvania style game, allowing players to go back to previous areas and explore from different angles. I love everything about the messenger, from the retro look and feel of the game, to the Ninja Gaiden inspired gameplay, and of course the amazing chiptune soundtrack. The Messenger is a great homage to some of my favorite classic games, while also managing to stand on its own and do something unique. I'll definitely be putting more time into this one. Hellblade Sinuous Sacrifice is a journey through madness and hell. Wait, haven't we been on this journey before? Hellblade was included in a monthly bundle exactly one year ago. So if Humble's gonna recycle their picks, I guess I'm gonna recycle my script. You play as Senua, who is dealing with psychosis. She constantly hears voices. Some jeer at her, a few encourage her. Several of them disagree with each other. The way this is handled is excellent, and it made me constantly feel judged by these imaginary voices that I just couldn't successfully ignore. The big draw here is the incredible art, especially given this is not a AAA game. As a trade-off, the gameplay is a little simplistic, but it's still enjoyable and largely exists to tell a story and show off the gorgeous Viking hellscapes. You'll mostly be exploring, solving puzzles, and engaging in combat. Puzzles are usually perspective-based, asking you to find a sigil in the environment or look at something from a certain point of view. Combat is pretty simple on the normal difficulty, with a light attack, strong attack, kick, parry, run, and dodge. And not a ton of enemy variety, but it's still fun. 
The controls aren't really explained to you, so you can easily get away without using many of the combat moves, but they are there for you to find. The game also comes with a threat of permadeath, as a black mark takes hold of Senua's arm. When you die, the mark spreads, and if it reaches your head, your progress is wiped. Supposedly. The game tells you this, but I've heard conflicting reports on if that's true or not. If the idea of permadeath turns you off, I wouldn't worry about it, because the game is pretty easy. And assuming there is permadeath after a while, I have yet to hear of anyone dying enough to lose their save file. And this game is just too good to miss for a reason like that. This also comes with the VR version of the game, which a lot of work went into to make it fit. A lot of people like it, but personally the camera being frequently taken over by cutscenes made it kind of uncomfortable for me to play that way. But if you have a VR headset, it's worth a shot. If you were subbed when this game was in the Humble Monthly Bundle, or you already own it from some other source, this should be an obvious drop unless you want to gift it to a friend. Otherwise, if you like gorgeous, hellish environments, and the idea of immersing yourself in the voices in Sinua's head, grab this one for sure. Grid is a racing game from developer Codemasters and released in 2019. Grid serves as more of an arcade-style racer than most of the other Codemaster games like F1 or Dirt. Players have access to a number of different styles of cars, from stock cars to GT sports cars, touring cars, and more. As you progress through the career mode, you'll be competing in each different class of race to try and earn an invitation to compete in the Grid World Series. It almost goes without saying at this point, but just like all the other Codemaster games, Grid looks absolutely stunning. Just watching the cars race around the track can be mesmerizing, and if it weren't for the in-game HUD and racing line markers, you could think you were watching an actual race. Gameplay will feel familiar to anyone who's played a Codemasters game before, but it's more immediately accessible to newcomers. It isn't at need for speed or burnout levels of arcade racing, but it's nowhere near the complexity of something like F1 2019. It doesn't take much getting used to the controls before you're drifting around corners, overtaking like a pro, and looking awesome while doing so. The arcade-focused gameplay, combined with the usual Codemasters features like variable difficulty and a rewind function, allows even complete racing game newcomers to fit right in without much training. Overall, Grid does a lot to impress. The much more casual racing experience is a welcome change of pace from the other Codemasters games we've gotten from past bundles, and the game is incredibly impressive from a visual and presentation standpoint. I'll be putting a lot more time into Grid for sure. Superland is a first-person exploration game that's all about upgrades. You're a citizen of the Red Kingdom equipped with a sword and sent out on a simple objective to go have a chat with the Blue Kingdom, which you'll quickly find is easier said than done. There's all sorts of obstacles in your way, and at least with your starting capabilities, no way to get past them. You'll need to collect coins so you can buy upgrades at the shop, as well as golden barrels to expand the shop's offerings. As soon as you can, get the speed increase upgrade. It's a major increase, and it makes coming back to the shop to get other upgrades so much faster. Each functional upgrade you buy will open up new spots for you to explore, getting you more money and golden barrels to get access to more unlocks, so these feed really well into each other. Some upgrades you'll find out in the field and chests, which can be anything from sword damage to displaying a health bar or making enemies drop loot when you kill them. I found myself wanting to explore every nook and cranny, both for the fun of it as well as to unlock my next upgrade. I got the feeling from playing that it was going to be a relatively short game because I was getting such significant upgrades so quickly, but as it turns out, I've barely scratched the surface, and there's a wealth of tools to unlock that all serve to help you solve puzzles, explore, or fight. I've talked a lot about exploration because it's my favorite part of the game, but I should touch on the puzzles in combat as well. Puzzles are well done, and give you lots of visual clues to follow on how to solve them. Despite a lot of the puzzles involving physics, I didn't have to deal with any of the jank that usually comes with that kind of thing, and once I knew what I was supposed to do, I didn't have any trouble executing the solution. Combat, at least at the start, is pretty simple. You have a sword, and you can swing it really fast. It's not bad, and it works fine, but it's not super interesting. It's also not a big part of the game, and it's more of something to do while moving between points of interest. I know that after unlocking the Force Cube, you can drop those on the heads of your enemies, and I'm assuming you can get other tools to make combat more interesting later on, but as far as I've gotten, combat isn't really something that adds or detracts from the game for me. Visually, the game looks great. Everything takes place in a world built by a child out of household items like pencils, screwdrivers, and candles. This is also a game that respects your time. The game would throw me an upgrade or unlock a shortcut that would make me say, yes, thank you. I really like this one. I think all of its systems feed well into each other, and it's got a lot of polish in the right places. 
There's a free demo you can try on Steam to decide if it's right for you. So overall, how was this bundle? There was a great amount of variety this month. Just about every game was from a significantly different genre than the rest. As noted before, Hellblade was in a previous bundle. With Humble Choice being all about choosing what games you want to get, I actually kind of like when there's one or two games I already have in there, so I can get everything I'm missing. But for people who are more picky about what goes into their Steam libraries and have been subscribed to Humble for a while, I can definitely understand feeling upset about essentially starting off with 11 games to choose from instead of 12. Barrow Trauma was a surprise multiplayer hit for me this month, as I hadn't heard of it and it doesn't look at all like something I would like to play. But I already have several buddies who picked it up in this bundle to play together, and it's a surprisingly fun game to fail at. Superland is also one I wouldn't have looked at otherwise, and I can tell I will be pouring a lot of time into that game. I was pretty impressed with this month's choices. Humble seems to have brought back some much needed variety, and it's definitely a welcome change of pace. Men of War feels even older than it actually is, and it almost brings my opinion of the whole bundle down, but highlights like The Messenger and Stygian quickly made me forget about that mess of a title. Also of note, people who get the June bundle will get an extra mystery game at the end of the month. The last time we got something like this, the mystery game was Train Valley 2. I wouldn't make your decision to get the bundle or not get the bundle based on the mystery game, as it could really be anything. But if you do decide to get the bundle, don't forget to grab your extra game next month. If you want to figure out how much your particular picks are worth, here's the retail price of each game. If you're interested in what Chris and I dropped this month, I already owned Hellblade, The Messenger, and Remnants of Nazith, so I'll have to pick one of these to give to a friend. If I didn't own any of these, I think I would have dropped Grid and Men of War simply because I really don't like racing in RTS games. As for my picks, I dropped Hellblade, as I already picked that game up after hearing Austin gush about it on one of the other 12 times he's covered it for the channel. And I'm also dropping Felix the Reaper, as puzzle games still just are not my jam. However, if I didn't already own Hellblade, I definitely would have dropped Men of War Assault Squad 2, as there's just almost nothing about that game that appeals to me. Finally, a huge thank you to Michael Slater, Charlie Grant, and all of our patrons over on Patreon. Your support means the world to us. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you all next time.